Gerald, I don't know exactly what I'm doing these days, and after lunch today, I feel even more clueless. I need you to know that I never wanted or thought in a million years that this would be happening to us. I also need you to know that I have never felt so low. This is not easy for me at all. I can't bring myself to sign the divorce papers. This all seems so unreal to me. I'm so sorry I doubted your capacity to forgive me early on, but I just couldn't imagine that you would ever be able to live with me again after knowing what I did. I wish I had done things differently and handled myself better. It was good to see you and have a normal conversation like we used to. I hope you have a fun weekend. See you Wednesday, Lisa. So I met him for dinner Thursday night. Nothing was discussed until we were about to leave. And I couldn't hold my tongue any longer. Turns out, he was married before and may have some issues. Pretty big ones in my opinion. Case in point, he's been divorced three years and by his own admission, he dated quite a bit in the interim, but nothing that has lasted longer than two months. Sounds like a pattern to me. We'll talk more later. For those who might not be aware, Enron was an American energy company which imploded in the early aughts amid revelations of accounting fraud. We are deeply disturbed and angry to learn that company executives and directors who were charged with safeguarding the company's, company's value have apparently engaged in activities to benefit themselves individually at the expense of customers, investors, and employees. More than 1 million emails of 151 employees were seized in order to decipher what went on inside the company. Later on, after some data cleanup, 600,000 of those emails became available online for everyone to see. What makes these emails so special is the fact that they are the foundation of several technologies we use daily. Spam filters were created based on data from Enron's emails. The early versions of uh, Siri use these datasets. Gmail's uh, Smart Compose, the feature which uh, suggests what you're about to write, was initially trained on Enron's emails. Software for fraud detection, counterterrorism, or even uh, how we interpret language has been somehow touched by this dataset. The use of Enron's emails is far and wide. They were sought after by researchers and companies because they offered a huge dataset that was publicly available and had everyday naturally occurring dialogue. Of course, using these emails in research raises a couple of concerns. The first issue has to do with privacy. Despite efforts to delete and anonymize sensitive information, there were still personal information available for everyone to see. Social security numbers, phone numbers, and bank account uh, records could be found in the original data dump of the emails. And then there's of course the actual content of the emails. Walk me out, I'll give you a big wet kiss. Affairs, family issues, office politics, it's all there in black and white. One would argue that using a work email for personal matters is a recipe for disaster, but what we need to keep in mind is that the odds were a simpler time as far as internet etiquette. People just didn't know any better. I would like for you to please try to think of me at least once today and call me back. The other issue with the use of Enron's emails has to do with the data bias they introduced to our research project. As Amanda Lewandowski, a New York University researcher, writes in her 2017 paper, if you think there might be significant biases embedded in emails sent among employees of a Texas oil and gas company that collapsed under federal investigation for fraud stemming from systemic, institutionalized, and ethical culture, you would be right. The Enron emails are simply not representative, not geographically, not socioeconomically, not even in terms of race or gender. Indeed, researchers have used the Enron emails specifically to analyze gender bias and power dynamics. We've seen the effects of data bias before in projects from other tech companies. Let's take for example Microsoft's AI chatbot. In 2016, Microsoft released a conversational Twitter bot. 
As Microsoft said in their initial press release, the more people chat with Tay, the smarter it gets, learning to engage in casual and playful conversation. Things started innocently enough with messages like this. But it didn't take long for the bot to start spitting out messages like these. The users interacting with the AI bot were constantly tweeting racist, misogynistic, and hateful comments, and as a result, the bot started mimicking these comments. The bot interacted with a very specific type of data. Machine learning systems inevitably reproduce the patterns and biases existing in the data used to train them. We need to be asking questions of who is represented in training datasets, what bias this produces, and how these systems then go on to be used. A year earlier, Amazon was faced with a similarly biased AI. Amazon wanted to automate the hiring process and reduce the time recruiters spent on manually screening CVs. To automate the process, they trained the AI with data that spanned 10 years of uh, hiring. Since Amazon and the tech sector in general is heavily populated by men, the AI algorithm assumed that male candidates were preferable. As a result, it penalized resumes that included the word woman, for example, women's chess club captain. Once that was discovered, Amazon stopped the use of this automated system. Biases cannot be entirely eliminated, but researchers are at least aware of them and continually try to take them out of their models. Google, Facebook, and other companies have introduced bigger datasets since the initial release of Enron's emails, but in turn, the way these datasets are collected has raised a lot of privacy concerns. Enron, despite its absolutely atrocious practices, in a way has redeemed itself. This huge email dataset allowed so many advances in so many different fields. If you want to have a look at those emails, you can do so on Brandon Levine's excellent art project, The Good Life. It's a retro 90s website where you can sign up to receive all 500,000 emails in chronological order and in a span of 7 to 28 years. The website even has a nice search function, so if you don't want to litter your inbox with meeting reminders and sexist jokes, you can just sift through them there. Reading through the emails, you get a sense of what it was like working in that company and the kind of culture cultivated at Enron. I'll have the website in the description below along with other links you might find uh, interesting. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.